Hello and welcome to lecture two for topic three this week. Um, the, we're, we're looking at the United States Constitution and gender equality. And this lecture is going to focus on the cases you're gonna be reading about this week. So what's, here's a quick overview of what you're gonna be learning about this in this lecture. We're gonna take a look at gender equality as it was um, handled by the courts prior to the mid part of the 20th century. And in there, we're going to be taking a look at sort of the dominant viewpoint that drove the decisions in that time period, the separate spheres viewpoint that is um, springs forth from this thing called romantic paternalism. And then we're going to take a look at gender equality from the mid 20th century to today and look at the way that the courts have applied the equal protection clause to gender equality. And we'll be looking at four key cases from that time period that you will be reading about in your textbook. All right, so the idea of equal protection of the law is a modern idea. I mean, for one thing, the um, 14th Amendment wasn't added to the Constitution until 1865. And so there wasn't really an understanding of this broad national um, equal protection under the law. Uh, but even after it was added to the Constitution, um, it was not seen as applying to uh, gender inequality. And so until the mid 20th century, equal protection, uh, the Equal Protection Clause from the 14th Amendment did not apply to sex. It only applied to race. Well, why is that? Why was racial discrimination or unequal treatment based on race seen as a potential violation of the Equal Protection Clause, but different treatment on the basis of sex was not. Well, a lot of that had to do with the social belief at that time and really through the mid part of the 20th century and maybe to until today um, from some people's perspective, it's the social belief that women and men should, should be treated differently that they are fundamentally different, um, both biologically and in other ways as well. And therefore they should possess separate spheres within our society. Um, and therefore uh, being treated differently in the eyes of the law is really in no way an unjustified discrimination. Okay. So how is separate spheres rooted in romantic paternalism? Romantic paternalism is a belief based on the romantic notion that women are the gentler sex, that they need to be sheltered from the harsh world that's outside the home because they are the gentler sex, and therefore they're best suited for home and family life, and that they are unfit for the dirty world of politics and the workaday world that's outside of the home. And so that society has this obligation to protect them from these um, dark and harmful things. As a result, um, that viewpoint uh, led to women being uh, denied the ability to participate in economic and political life that was outside of the home um, into the 20th century. Um, it wasn't until 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment that women got the right to vote. Um, they couldn't, for the most part, hold political office. At least there was no national uh, ability or national requirement that um, you can't discriminate based on sex for holding office. They were not able to serve on juries and they were excluded from most educational institutions um, and professions that were deemed for men only um, well into the 20th century. And so romantic paternal really paternalism really had this sort of um, very limiting effect on women's lives, but it also sort of reinforced this idea that e unequal treatment is okay because it's protecting women. Separate spheres was challenged in the court, but unsuccessfully. And your textbook talks about three cases that, sphere, uh, that challenged um, unequal treatment based on sex. The first one is Bradwell versus Illinois, a, a case from 1873, and it dealt with the, uh, the issue of whether women have a right to practice law as a profession. Um, it's a case that was brought to the Supreme Court by Myra Bradwell. 
Um, she was the founder and chief editor of the Chicago Legal News, a publication about law and legal rulings uh, throughout, the uh, throughout the state of Illinois. Um, she was married to James Bradwell, who was a lawyer and a judge, and she studied law with her husband. Uh, she took the bar exam in Illinois and passed it, and she applied for admission to the state bar through the Illinois Supreme Court, and she was denied admission. And because she was denied admission, why? Because she was married. Um, at that time, and as we're gonna be learning about later in the semester, once you got married, you basically lost your legal standing in the eyes of the, uh, of the community. Um, you basically became subsumed under, under your husband's legal identity. And so um, women were not allowed to, for one, uh, they were not allowed to contract with other people because they didn't have a legal identity. And so um, the, the Supreme Court basically said that it was justified that Bradwell was denied the right to practice law because as a married woman, she did not have any legal right to contract. And as a lawyer, you need to have the legal right to contract. Um, you'll note that P and I there in the parentheses, she argued the case under the privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment that we talked about in the last lecture, um, saying that the right to practice a profession, profession was a, a privilege that was granted to all citizens of the United States, but the Supreme Court did not buy that case. The other case that your textbook talks about is Minor versus Happerstamp from 1875, and that's to do with whether or not a person has a constitutional right to vote. Using the Privileges and Immunity Clause, uh, women who uh, tried to vote and were arrested argued that they had a right under the Privileges and Immunities Clause to vote, and the court said that that was not the case. The women were citizens, but just by being a citizen doesn't mean that you have a national right to vote, that that's determined state by state. Um, that the decision in Minor v. Hapistat is obviously overruled by the passage of the 19th Amendment, but it's a good example of how this idea of separate spheres is upheld by the courts. And then finally, your textbook talks about Goser, Goseret v. Cleary. And this is an interesting case, and note the date, 1948. It's an interesting case because it's the first case that argues that unequal treatment of women violates not the Privileges and Immunities Clause, but the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In this case, um, that, uh, that it, 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 it dealt with a law that said that women, women could not work in bars, okay? Um, but the, uh, so the only time they would let women work in bars, be bartenders or bar maids, was if their father owned the bar. Um, and the thinking was, is if the father owned the bar, then they could, you know, uh, put out their sphere of romantic paternalism and protect their daughters or their wives from anything bad that might take place in the bar. In this case, it was a woman who owned a bar and she wanted to um, uh, have herself work in the bar and also to have her daughters work in the bar. And the court said no, um, that because she was a woman, she had no right to work in the bar or to have other women work in the bar uh, because she did not have the capacity to protect other women or herself from the dangers of the uh, of the bar room environment. Um, the case itself, you know, the details of the case are not as important as the fact that it was the first case that was br brought to the Supreme Court on equal protection grounds um, and it failed. But it's important because it paves the way for the, 20, the mid 20th century. Um, do take note of this great quote from the um, ruling in Bradwell. Your textbook takes note of it, but it's a great encapsulation of the separate spheres doctrine. In the concurring opinion from Justice Joseph Bradley, he wrote that the paramount destiny and mission of women are to, to fulfill the noble and benign office of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator and the rules of civil society must be adapted to the general constitution of things and cannot be based upon exceptional cases like Myra Bradwell. So again, a nice encapsulation of that viewpoint. So this brings us to this 20th century and a search for a standard for how the we should interpret the Equal Protection Clause and whether or not it applies to um, to, uh, unequal treatment on the basis of sex.
the 20 in the 20th century the court the supreme court begins to search for a standard to apply to different treatment of women um as we talked about in our last lecture we asked a question about whether or not sex should be treated like race remember we talked about race as being a suspect category or classification and that when people are treated differently based on their race um, that the court should give that those laws that do that incredibly strict scrutiny um, and so the question is is should um, gender be treated like race or should it be treated and again we talked about this in the last lecture as a less suspect category like age citizenship or income and use that much lower standard for um, providing scrutiny which is as your textbook talks about the rational basis scrutiny or should it be something in between when laws differentiate and treat men and women de uh, differently what standard should be used maybe we need an in-between standard and in fact that's the standard that has been created when we're looking at sex discrimination and the equal protection clause and it is called the intermediate uh, scrutiny standard um, I'm just touching on these in the lecture. If you would like more information, read about it in your textbook, and I would also be more than happy to go over it with you in more detail in a virtual office hour um, because it's one of my favorite issues, but I didn't want to bore you with all the details in the lecture here. So your textbook looks at four cases and the development of the sex discrimination standard. They look at Reed versus Reed in 1971 and um, where the rational basis standard is used to determine whether or not a law violates the equal protection clause but they apply that rational basis standard in a very vigorous application there's the frontiero versus richardson case from 1972 um, that comes the closest to using strict scrutiny standard as the basis for determining whether or not sex discrimination um, uh, is violates the equal protection clause so you'll read in your textbook that it the the opinion of the court uses the strict scrutiny standard but unfortunately they only had four of the justices who abided by the strict scrutiny standard thus creating a plurality and not a majority so it 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 was used but not with without the force of law and did not act as a precedent we're going to be reading about the frothy case, Craig v. Boren, which has to do with different age standards for the consumption of what's called near beer from 1976. Um, and it's that case that's important, even though it seems to deal with something that's sort of inconsequential, the ability to drink like nearly non-alcoholic beer. It's a really important case because it creates the compromised intermediate scrutiny standard that we use for evaluating sex discrimination cases. And then we'll finish out here, and I'm sorry, that's a typo that should say 1995, or I'm sorry, 1996, um, with the United States v. Virginia case that has to do with the Virginia military institution. This is an important case because it applies the immediate scrutiny standard that is created in Craig v. Boren, but does it in a way that comes very, very close to um, strict scrutiny. And it is a standard that is currently used by the court. So let's take a moment to look at these different cases. All right, so let's look at Reed versus Reed, the 1971 case. So who's Sally Reed? Uh, she's really pissed off about something. Uh, what is she pissed off about? Well, she's pissed off because um, she has a son whose name is Skip. Um, and she was married to a man whose name was Cecil. And she was in an unhappy marriage. And um, uh, Cecil leaves Sally early on, and Sally raises her son Skip alone for most of her life. And she has a great relationship with her son, and her son turns out to be, you know, a great guy. Um, but then he dies early in his life at the age of 21. And um, and he has a he doesn't have a lot of money, but he had a little bit of money. And um, that when somebody dies and they don't have a will then you have to figure out who's going to be basically be the administer, who's going to administer that person's estate. Well, the Reeves lived in Idaho. And in Idaho, they had this law in the books that said that when a child dies without a will, the father automatically becomes the administrator of the estate of the child. 
and that really pissed Sally off. For one, she wanted the opportunity to argue for why she should administer the child's, her grown child's estate, but she wasn't given that opportunity. And so she sues the state of Idaho, um, basically saying that, um, that she has the right to administer her son's estate. Um, and it, the Idaho Supreme Court hears the case and they reject um, Reed's claim of sex discrimination. They say that it's reasonable to let men default to men to administer the estates because they know more about money and about estate administration. Um, they also say that it is reduces the litigation that could happen between people arguing between who should be the administrator of the estate. So she loses at the Idaho Supreme Court, but she takes it to the Supreme Court of the United States and wins. And the, the, the United States Supreme Court says in a seven to zero ruling that the law, the Idaho law violates the, um, the, uh, the equal protection um, clause of the 14th amendment. And they, they use the rational basis standard to come to that determination. They basically say that there's, it's not reasonable to think that women can't administer the state. So the, the law is based on irrational beliefs. They say that women lo live longer than men, and so they actually have more practice administering estates than do men because they oftentimes outlive their husbands. Also, the state of Idaho, Idaho said it was just easier to let men do it, right? That it was an, in, it was an administrative inconvenience to determine who should do it, the woman or the, the husband or the wife, or the, in this case, the father or the mother. And they said that that was an illegitimate, um, uh, that, that that's not a legitimate state interest. So Reed is an important case because it's the first case to apply the Equal Protection Clause to gender discrimination. It also uses the rational basis standard, but in a way that um, actually provides protection for women uh, uh, based on sexual discrimination. The second case that um, your textbook looks at is a famous case called Frontero versus Richardson. Um, and this is the case that actually uses the strict standards, uh, the strict scrutiny standard, but doesn't have five justices to make it um, be the precedent in terms of the standard that's used. Um, so what's going on in this case? Well, Sally uh, Fr Frontero's pissed off about something. That's what brings court cases to the Supreme Court. What is she pissed off about? Well, she's an Air Force Lieutenant in the United States Air Force, and she gets married. And when people in the Air Force get married, um, that they get more benefits, right? So the thinking is you're married, so you have more responsibilities. So you get increased housing allowance, and you also get increased dental and medical benefits. And as you read about, or as you will read about in your textbook, when Sally Frontera, um, uh, opened her check after she got married and she expected to see this extra money in her check, um, there wasn't that extra money there. And she thought it was a mistake. And she's like, hey, I got married. Where are my extra benefits? It wasn't a mistake. And so um, what Sally Front Frontiero found out was that only men got those extra benefits. Women didn't get those extra benefits. The thinking was is that when men get married, they have to take care of a dependent wife. But when women get married, the guy's not dependent on the, the woman. And so they don't deserve the extra benefits. Um, and uh, they only got those extra benefits if in fact the husband was not working and was indeed totally dependent upon the wife. And that wasn't the case in the, the marriage of um, Sally and to her husband, Joseph. Um, that he did make enough money so that he was not deemed as being dependent upon, um, upon his wife. And so she, she, um, she sues uh, the, um, the, uh, federal, the, that law that governs the distribution of, of benefits um, for those who are in the Air Force. And they asked, you know, the question before the court is, is that federal law um, that uses a different criteria for men and women um, is that a violation of the Equal per Protection Clause? Now, in point of fact, since it's the military, you're going to learn that they did. It's not really an Equal Protection Clause case, but it is a Due Process Clause case um, from the Fifth Amendment because that applies to the federal government. 
But as your textbook points out, the due process clause pl plays the same role as the equal protection clause does as it applies to states. The, the Supreme Court in an 8-1 ruling argued, uh, found that in fact that law was unconstitutional and that because the men and women were similarly situated in the military, it, it was not fair to treat them um, uh, differently. That the idea that um, women are dependent on men when they get married and men aren't dependent on women when they get married, that that's based on stereotypes and the constitution forbids differences based on arbitrary, irrational, and stereotypical um, classifications. Um, and so it's an important case because it uses the strict scrutiny as a standard, even though it doesn't rise to the level of a precedent standing, standing uh, um, standard. It, it's also important because it, it highlights the role that stereotypes play in um, sexual uh, classifications and how those stereotypical differences are, are um, quasi-suspect categories. The next case that you're going to be reading about is Craig v. Boren, um, and that is has to do with 3.2 beer, which is that low-level alcohol beer and sex discrimination. And there's a picture of um, the now-departed uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And as I had mentioned in the earlier lecture that you listened to, before Ruth Bader Ginsburg became a justice on the Supreme Court, she spent a lot of time um, litigating uh, court cases um, that dealt with sex discrimination. And this is one of the cases that she litigated, Craig v. Born. This is an interesting case because it's not about sex discrimination against women, particularly like women who are harmed by um, treat, uh, laws that treat men and women differently. But this is a case that deals with men who feel like they're harmed by laws that treat men and women differently. This was a case about Oklahoma and purchasing beer. And in Oklahoma, um, that uh, everybody needed to be 21 to buy the hard liquor like whiskey. But when it came to this low level intoxicating beer, women could buy it at 18, but men had to wait till they were 21 to buy it. Uh, the thinking was is that women mature, uh, women mature earlier than men, and you gotta wait a little bit because men are wild and not fully developed until they get older. Um, and so uh, uh, that's what that case was about, that having the different laws on the book for when you can buy beer, uh, is that a, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause? And the decision in this case was yes, that the Oklahoma law that has different ages, it does violate the Equal Protection Clause and is thus unconstitutional. Um, the reasoning they gave was that the classification by gender, it must serve an important government objective and it must be substantially related to achieving this objective. And that's the intermediate scrutiny standard that you talk, that you learn about in your textbook. They said that this is not the case here. They talked about how, oh, you can't let guys drink beer because they're going to crash their cars. But that wasn't based on fact um, that uh, when men and women uh, uh, when uh, did not um, engage in reckless drunk driving uh, at, a, at an unequal standard, it was about the same. Um, and so that perhaps prohibiting men from drinking the beer until they were 21, it wasn't based on a, an important government objective and that this law did not achieve it. Why this case is important is because it creates the intermediate standard that's used by the court. It's also an interesting case because it shows that sex stereotypes influence and impact not just women, but they influence and impact men as well. The final case that you're going to be learning about is United States versus Virginia, the 1996 case that deals with the Virginia Military Institute. Um, by this time, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on the Supreme Court and she writes the majority opinion for the court in the Virginia Military Institute case. Um, as you'll read, and we won't talk a lot about it here, but um, you know, the Virginia Military Institute is this long last, it's a, it has a long history. It was founded in 1839. It's a really unique experience. It's an all, it was an all men's institution. You had to be a man to be admitted to Virginia Military Institute. And it was like really hardcore. 
like for the first seven months that you, that where you're in at VMI, all the new people there are called rats and they are treated to like the seven month onslaught of grueling treatment. Um, and the, the thinking is, is that this grueling treatment molds characters, it produces leaders, it bonds people for life. Um, but you had to be a guy to go to Virginia Military Institute. Uh, in Starting in the late 1980s, 347 women sought admission into VMI and nobody got a response from their admissions. They weren't even rejected. Their, admit, their applications were ignored. A female high school student filed a complaint with the U.S. Attorney General and a complaining about the male-only admissions, saying that it violated the um, Equal Protection Clause and the United States government agreed. Um, you can read about the details of this case in the textbook. The bottom line, though, is that the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Virginia Military Institute's male-only um, admissions policy violated the 14th Amendment's uh, Equal Protection Clause. Um, they, they ruled that, um, that, uh, they, that there was no ex persuasive justification for the gendered bias treatment and that the gendered bias treatment was really motivated more on stereotypes than anything else. Um, and so uh, that uh, Virginia Military Institute had to open its doors to, um, to women. And as you'll read about in your textbook, women have actually done quite well. They were really worried that the standards at VMI would go down when women came through the doors. But if anything, it says that they increased their standards, like they made it even harder on the rats. And that's because it was found that there are certain women who applied to VMI that did have the interest, the desire, and the drive to go through that experience and come out the other end still standing. And so um, all four of these cases are important cases to learn about because it, it lets us understand the, the way in which the courts have used the Equal Protection Clause to provide uh, um, equal treatment between men and women. All right, thanks a lot for listening. I know this was a little bit longer than I would have liked it to be, but these are important cases, and hopefully this will help you understand what you're reading about in your textbooks.